happy ho ho holidays and welcome to Concert Pipeline. I'm Steve Jones. Uh, unfortunately, Jens, my co-host, couldn't be here for the final episode of the year. What'll probably be the final episode, uh, I imagine, um, as uh, as things are looking right now. Although sometimes that changes, um, things slow down a little bit at the end of the year, and it's for the best, right? A lot of the artists get to spend time with their families, take a little break from touring, which is back, which is which is amazing, uh, and. Um, and really just uh, take, take a little bit of time off. So I'm not pushing either. I'm taking some time myself, uh, spending a good amount of time out duck hunting, uh, which is a, a fun hobby of mine. And so uh, so that's kind of what's been going on. Uh, there might be a week or two between episodes here and there, but uh, we'll so we get back going again in uh, January and as we get into to February for sure. Um, today in the program, uh, I'm really proud to say that we have uh, a great guest, a really holiday-centered guest. Uh, his name is Steve Marsh Torme, uh, and he is uh, he had two very influential sons in the entertain fathers, excuse me, <laughs> in the entertainment business. Um, first is his uh, biological dad, uh, who is Mel Torme, uh, co-wrote um, the Christmas song. Uh, also known as chestnuts roasting on an open fire. So he's made a big dent in, uh, in the world, and especially around this time frame. Uh, his, uh, his music you can't get away from, right? Um, been around forever, and it'll, it'll be one of those songs that'll be around forever. Uh, so Steve has followed uh, in his father's footsteps, in a sense, in this regard, and, uh, and wrote a song called I Remember Christmas Time, which was released 76 years after Mel Torme uh, co-wrote the Christmas song for Nat King Cole. So that's pretty cool. Also, Steve's uh, stepfather, who he uh, grew up more so with, um, is um, Mel, uh, no, I'm sorry, excuse me, not, not Mel, sorry, that, that is his uh, actual father, it's Hal uh, March, uh, who was the uh, best known as the host for the $64,000 question. Uh, he also was uh, in, uh, in some episodes of I Love Lucy, which is pretty cool, uh, and stuff around that time frame. So, uh, so Steve's grown up in these two different kind of world sets, and we had a chance to talk through um, his experience, uh, both with his biological dad um, and also with his uh, stepfather, which, you know, both of them influenced him in, uh, in different ways. Um, and uh, and Steve also played uh, his uh, single "I Remember Christmas Time" for the program, so a uh, little bit of something to look forward to um, in in our interview. So I'm not going to waste a lot of time up front talking, but I will come back at the uh, end of the program after the interview, and I want to kind of just recap some of the highlights of uh, the year for Concert Pipeline. Um, we've done a lot of programs. We've grown a lot over the past year, and I have a lot to be proud of. So um, with that being said, I want to hop right into my, my interview with Steve March Torman. Uh, here it is. Hey, I would say, how, how are you doing? Oh, I'm doing, I'm doing good. Uh, I'm yeah. out here on the West Coast in California, uh, Napa, uh, to, be, to be specific. And um, you're in Wisconsin, right? Uh, I am indeed, because I, I decided for some reason to leave Santa Monica. Why, why would you do such a thing? <laughs> well, I, I get asked that question quite often, and I have one answer. It's always the same. The ring. The Thank ring. you. Yes. Uh, why else would I leave? You know why I left? Because it wasn't quite cold enough in Anchorage. I just, you know, I think Wisconsin could be really cold. Did you, did you spend some time in Alaska? Like, how long were you there? No, I, I, I have been there, though. I, I, I performed up in Fairbanks and in Anchorage. Have you ever been there? I have not. No, it's gorgeous, and, it, and it's yeah. as cold as they say. But it, yeah, it's really beautiful. Yeah, it's beautiful. Really beautiful. I'll tell you, Wisconsin is actually probably the coldest place I've I've been in. A, a couple of years back, like 2019, I, I went out uh, and uh, and I actually went to the the Packers Bears game, um, and uh, it was like seven degrees. I know that's like a warm day, although right now you're in your mid 30s or something like that, so it's like summer probably for you, right? Well, so actually three days ago took my girls to school and it was one it's like oh uh, one one is fun singular degree yeah <laughs> yeah yeah uh packers are playing the bears uh at lambo this sunday yes yes yeah. uh, i'm sure i'm sure it'll be i will not game. get him i will not no 
No. But you're a big sports fan, you know, and uh, I mean, which do you prefer, baseball or, or football at this point? I know I saw you post a lot about football, but you wanted to be a baseball player. Um, baseball is my first love. I just think it's a great game. But I, I watch, look, I watch college football. I watch pro football. Um, my stepdad, my stepdad taught me how to throw. Um, so, you know, I, I played enough street football and just, you know, ragtag football that I enjoyed it. I like them both. I mean, there's a reason that football is compelling. Obviously, you only get 16 games. It's once a week. Uh, they're doing things that the human body was not designed to do. Uh, yeah. yeah, the human body's not designed to play tackle football. Um, and I, I, I look, I admire the fact that these guys, as big as they are and as much money as they make, they are beat the heck out of from the first from the first practice, much less game. Uh, yeah. So it's fun. You know, we're, we're watching gladiators and pads beat the you know what out of each other. So it, their bodies twist in ways that is, is not they're not supposed to. It's like, how is your head even connected still after that, that blow? Right. Like, it's crazy. Uh, and, the, and they're injured. There's a reason. They, yeah, they get injured. I love how yeah. people say, don't, it seems like, you know, more guys pull hamstrings. That didn't happen back, you know, back in the old days. Don't they train well? I said, oh, trust me. They pulled it back then, too. They just didn't come out of the game because they yeah. weren't making $17 million a year. Yeah. yeah. yeah Big exactly difference. Really yeah. yeah. But, but for you, you wanted, to, you wanted to play baseball when you were younger. You're, you're, like you said, your stepdad taught you to, to throw. Was he, uh, was he really into baseball? Was, or was that no, just a father? He was, he, was, uh, he was like me. He was, he was an athlete. I mean, he played, he played football. Um, he played baseball. He was a catcher. I mean, he, he, Hal was built like a bull. So, you know, of course, he was the center on the football team, and he was the catcher in baseball, the guys that could, you know, take blows. He was an amateur boxer. But he taught me how to play baseball and he taught me how to play football. He wasn't a basketball player. I taught myself how to play basketball. And my, my main source of, of exercise and recreation is I, I play tennis probably four to five times a week. So I'm self-taught there. He didn't play tennis, but he would have liked, he probably would have liked watching me play. Who knows? Hopefully. Who yeah. Knows? Yeah. And so, uh, so where, where did the love for music come in i mean obviously you know we'll get to your dad and everything you know obviously that's a part of the, the conversation but i know he wasn't a huge like influence because you were you you had your stepdad which was different but your stepdad was also on uh, on broadway is that right he he starred in neil neil simon's play come blow your horn um he was kind of a song and dance man when he wasn't doing the television show he was the kind of guy that during the summer would go do summer stock you know, he'd go out with um, Jack Klugman and they would do a play. Uh, so he was always, always had his hand in show business in, in some way. Uh, to answer your question about how I got influenced by music, there was a, a very obscure band from Liverpool. Um, they had something to do with it. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think myself, like a billion people that saw them on the Sullivan Show, we went, wow, this is nothing like Elvis. This is nothing like, you know, uh, Jerry Lee Lewis. This is completely different. And these guys look like they're really having fun. And I want to wear my hair like that. So I think, I think that was the first one. I mean, my influences were, you know, you know, you know the Beatles and um, Crosby, Stills and Nash and Joni Mitchell and the Doobie Brothers and Todd Rundgren and Steely Dan. That's what I grew up on. So yeah. Uh, I was influenced really early when I was when I wasn't listening to baseball games. I was to get this out there. Set a professional audio in audio settings. No, there's no prof there's no professionals here. It's just me. Yeah, come on. <laughs> um, so I think that was my my the, the first start was listening to the Beatles and people like that. And did you find them on your own, or did your was it playing in your house with your your mom? Like where where? No, it was like everybody else. The, it was the Ed Sullivan show. That was it. That so was the Ed Sullivan had... show, and I went out and bought Meet the Beatles. Everybody knows that that album cover with their kind of the half in shadow, mm -hmm. you know, and you look at that album cover today and you look at their hair and you go, they didn't have long hair. It's just yeah. not a crew cut, but you know, it's a little bit over the ears, but to, you know, parents were like, Oh, you're not wearing your hair like that. No, sir. Well, you know, we all know it's generations past now and you, you wear your hair any way you want. So. Yeah. And so, so you, and so you started your first band at 13. Was it like, you know, you, you wanted to be the Beatles? What was that kind of what you took into that first band? I think I've learned a great lesson over the years I've been doing this. Um, 
I, like many people, started a band because I want to be in a band and I want to make music, but I also knew I'd get attention. You know, and, oh, girls like guys in bands. Um, and the more I've done this, it has nothing to do with that. Uh, I just, I've come to a point where m making music and singing and performing and doing concerts really is about the audience and hearing from them afterwards. You know, when a woman comes up to me and says, now, he, he went to the bathroom. Don't, don't tell him that I told you this, but my husband was sitting there during your song and I haven't seen him with tears in his eyes on a concert in 30 years. I said, well, then I did something I affected him emotionally. I'll, you know, it's not, it's not my intent. You know, I don't, I don't do concerts and say, come to my concert and cry. Um, but at least if I'm connecting in some way, it's a lot more important than, hey, look at me, don't I look cool on a stage? So yeah, good lesson yeah. to learn. And so when you, when you started out, like um, what instrument did you play in, the, uh, in your first band? Like what was, what was that for you? My, the, I was just basically a singer. I was kind of like a Mick Jagger type. I was singing and dancing around and being ridiculous. I, I taught myself how to play guitar, taught myself how to play piano. And we are, we are in the midst right now of a 10 concert run here in the Midwest yeah. of the show called For Kids from 1 to 92. And it's, it's one of the best shows I've ever been a part of because of the, the musicianship, the people I'm playing with. I mean, Mark Wood. My Mark is, Wood and Michael Bailey, right? Yeah. Well, Mark Wood is one of the founding members of Trans Siberian Orchestra. He's a Juilliard grad, a brilliant electric violinist. Uh, the drummer I'm working with, and I've worked with so many people, is the best I've ever worked with. Uh, I've been working with him for quite a while here. You know, Lawrence University graduate and can play everything. And there are 14 people on stage. So um, to, to answer your question, it, it's just... It's, it's been inspiring to, to get an opportunity to, to play with people this good because it makes you up your game. And I play keyboards. When I'm not singing in the show, I do play keyboards. I also play guitar. There's a Charles Brown tune that the Eagles covered called Please Come Home for Christmas. Uh, bells will be ringing the sad, sad uh, song. Oh, what a Christmas to have the blues. And uh, I get a chance to play some blues guitar because most people don't know I can play guitar. So... Hey, you know, I got to do something. I can't do anything else, <laughs> to be perfectly honest with you. <laughs> yeah. So how have the shows been? I mean, with, I mean, on this side of COVID at this point, right? So, Well, you and I both know we're not really on the other side yet. I, I'm not that. saying clear. I didn't say clear or yeah, clear, yeah. but it's a, but we're, they're live shows and they can't exist, which this time last year, nope, right? So. This time last year, no shows. And if you were doing a show, it was probably virtual. And you were probably in your living room and hi, here's a song. I hope you enjoy it. And you finish a song, you know, and it goes. And there's silence. Yeah. Yeah. The no crowd goes wild, right? No. <laughs> Not even boo, you stink. Yeah. I would take that. Just silence. All right. Now here's another song. It was just really weird. So to answer your question, we're lucky we have 10 concerts this month. And, you know, because I also do radio, I, I host radio. Um, I go on different musicians' websites to check out, you know, what they're doing. And there are a lot of people that aren't working and, and I, I get it. And if you're a working musician, it's been really, really tough. I mean, if you're Michael Buble or you're, you know, Sheryl Crow or Sting, it doesn't matter. You go out next year when you got enough money. But for people that are depending on this for a living, it's been brutal. So I'm thankful that we have any shows. Yeah. Yeah, but the audiences show up and you're... Oh, we, you know. So far, so good. Um, and, you know, we played a 500-seat theater last night. We probably had 300 people. I think it would have been full if people weren't still kind of freaked out. This variant that's come out, I think they're still like, you know what? I really don't want to end up in a hospital bed and there's a shortage of beds. And the last thing I want to do is catch this thing and not everybody's masked up. And so we're still kind of coming out of this. I don't know what's going to happen. I hope that by next year, you know, everybody's vaccinated. Yeah. You know, like that, like that's really going to happen. Sure. But course. at least if more people are and we don't get hit with like, well, there are 10 more variants out. You might as well just stay home for the rest of your life. I'm with you. I, I, we're all yeah. sick of it. You know, no yeah. one's digging this. No one's like, well, I got a really nice designer mask last week. No, I don't want to hear about it. No. No one wants to wear a mask, but it's about doing the right thing to, you know, protect yourself and those around you and, you know, and hoping to one day get through this, right? Yeah. And the people that are saying, look, it's my choice. It's my body. If I don't want to wear a mask, my 
what I say to them is, I'm with you, but stay home. Yeah. Yeah. Stay home. I don't want to see you. If you want to stay there and get sick and you don't care, fine. But you, you're right. You are risking getting other people sick. And that's just selfish. It's so. not just about you. Yeah. That's my opinion. It's, it's, uh, yeah, let's, it's let's, let's, let's deep. Let's, I know. I know. Let's deep just, dig into politics. Let's make the whole show about <laughs> politics. <laughs> we don't need, there's so much other stuff that we can talk about. It's, uh, it's fine. Um, oh. So, so uh, tell me about uh, your Inside Out album um, and kind of going into that. I mean, you you, you did that uh, about 12 years ago, I think, at this point. And, yeah, um, yeah. and tell, tell me your approach to, to creating that album. Have you heard any of it? Yeah, I've listened to it. Uh, so I think I've listened to half of it. Oh, okay. So, yeah. um, well, you know, I started doing kind of like jazz albums, jazz pop albums, but kind of some big band kind of swing jazz stuff. And I like it and I've got an affinity for it probably because of dad, I, I, it's probably somewhat in the genes, I can sing jazz. But my roots, as I told you, the people I you know, was brought up on is really pop music. And I told myself before I did that album, I said, you know, I've got to sit down and, and write another original album before I get hit by a bus. You know, I've got to leave at least one more album because people do like the songs I write. I don't know, hopefully, I've heard that. People haven't said to me, you got a good voice, but you're not a very good writer. So they've liked what I've done. I said, well, I need to at least give it a shot and, and write a whole album of original tunes. And that's what that was. And the irony of this is that why you and I are, are talking here has to do with this song, I Remember Christmas Time. Yeah. Well, the first song that I wrote for the album was a song called A Different Time. And it's, I was in uh, Berlin, Wisconsin, which is where my wife and I first moved to when we came up in Los Angeles because her parents lived there. We wanted to be near them. We had just had our first child. And, you know, we had, my, my brothers and sisters had grown up there. We had no help. My parents were gone. And I'll make a long story very short. Uh, we we're in a park one day with, with both my kids and they were two and four years old. And I started thinking about how did I end up here? How did somebody who was born in Manhattan and lived in Westchester County, went to Beverly Hills High School and lived in Los Angeles for 30 years, how did I end up in a town of 3,000 people in the middle of Wisconsin? Um, and my conclusion was it was fine. My kids were safe. We we're in a park. I don't have to worry about any shootings, drive-bys. It's just, this, this is nice. This works. And that became a song on the album, the first one I wrote called A Different Time. And one of the guys, Michael Bailey, who you mentioned before, who I'm doing these concerts with, he always loved the song. From the first time you he heard it, he goes, he goes, dude, dude, you made me cry. And I said, well, I'm not trying to, but I, I appreciate that. And he came to me about a month and a half ago and said, um, I really like that song. I keep hearing a different title. I said, like what? He says, I, when you sing, I live in a different time, I keep hearing, I remember Christmas time. I said, okay. But well, you want me to change the song now? He goes, I think if we change some of the lyrics and make it more about Christmas, we might have something real special on our hands. Because as much as A Different Time is a nice song, which I like a lot, I've never made a dime off it because you know, who knows that thing's out there. Well, yeah. we put together I Remember Christmas Time two weeks ago. It came out on Thanksgiving. And you're media savvy. Uh, it's, yeah. it's hard to get a song on the radio no matter who you are, well, not no matter who you are, but if you're an independent artist, it's really hard to get any of your music on the radio. It just is. We've, it's been about two weeks. We've picked up 30 stations in two weeks. That just doesn't happen. It's pretty uh, impressive, yeah. And it's because it's a holiday it's, song. We still call yeah. it a different time. They go, that's a nice song, but we don't know who you are. Thanks very much. But People because eat that stuff up, yeah. Well, there's a story behind it and the fact that my dad wrote the Christmas song, and here's 76 years later, this song comes out, it's a nice song, and I think it's a nice song. So we'll see. Uh, I would love to hear Vince Gill cover this. Yeah. He's got a beautiful voice. He would bring in a country audience, which is fine with me because the song is very sentimental and very family oriented. And uh, that's, a, that's a big audience. So we'll see. I, I, I submitted it to Michael Bublé two days ago. His man. <laughs> haven't, haven't heard back yet, or? <laughs> His man. <laughs> we'll get back to you. Don't call yeah. us. <laughs> they sent me an email yesterday and it said, thanks so much for sending the song. Um, uh, we, we have to pass because we don't take any unsolicited material and uh, Michael has a very strict publishing deal, but thank you very much. So 
I got that. Look, I'm glad they got back to me. And it's a reply. Yeah. And the, my inner voice said, you know what? I should just write him back and say, you know, I bet if Mel Torme sent Michael a tune, he'd probably listen to it, but that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. But, so it yeah. is what it is. Um, yeah. But we'll get somebody because the song is getting traction and people like it. And if we get somebody to cover it, then it can become a perennial song. Then we can hear it every year. And that's kind of been our goal. So we'll yeah. see. Well, do you think now's a perfect time to, to play the song since we're talking about it? Well, I, I will give this a shot. Uh, tell me if, uh, uh, if the piano is up too loud or not too loud. That's good. Mm -hmm. It's okay? Yeah, I think we're uh, sounding good. All right, we'll give it a shot. Okay. All right, ladies and gentlemen, from his living room. Remember Christmas time it was a wondrous time when we were young, a treasured memory, sweet smell of evergreens filled with twinkling lights on winter nights with friends and family. And when I go back to that place. In a dream that's so sublime I see the smiles on every face and I remember Christmas time Carols sing of Christmas cheer Of the joy and hope and love we hear In children's voices Someone sings the Christmas song As I pass under the mistletoe Chestnuts roasting I'm driving down my childhood lane Past a life that once was mine New family lives inside that space. And I remember Christmas time. Good night, good life. Present becomes the past. Good friends. Great wife, memories are made to last. I went to a park today with a two-year-old and a four-year-old who call me daddy. I sat and I closed my eyes. And I listen to the joyous sounds of my kids laughing. Someday when we're gathered in our home, as we sing out old Lang Syne, we'll hold these moments in our hearts. We'll remember Christmas time. I remember Christmas time. And there you go. Boom. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. And I, I, I love the, you know, not to, I mean, it's, it's such a family song and the connection to your, your family as well. Your two daughters, your, your dad, with, you know, in, uh, in there as well, chestnuts roasting, like obviously um, a nod there. It's, it's a beautiful song. Thank you. And uh, 
my wife didn't even get this. I said, now, did you get the musical homage at the end? She goes, no, what are you talking about? I said this. Chestnuts roasting on an open fire. fire. So, it's a you know, little musical homage to dad. Uh -huh. Pave the way. It's, it's great, yeah. So, I mean, so of course, let's let's talk about your dad for a few minutes. I mean, I know you, um, your parents divorced when you were two and a half. I was my, I was about two and a half when my parents divorced. I think somewhere right around there. So I can, I get it, you know. But, um, but you didn't grow up with your dad directly. So, like, what was it like for you? You know, you knew about that song, of course, but um, kind of growing up knowing about his impact to this this holiday, this time period. Mm -hmm. I mean, he rock the world what yeah like? <laughs> yeah i mean it's a lot of people i mean there are some there are a lot of christmas songs obviously a lot of holiday yeah. songs I, I was talking about this uh, i did an interview yesterday and someone mentioned that you know a lot of the christmas songs aren't about christmas i mean frosty the snowman is not really about christmas it's about the snowman of uh, let it snow uh winter wonderland they're really more about winter than yeah. they are about specifically christmas but the fact that he you know, the story on this was pretty interesting. He was working with a, a partner named Bob Wells, uh, but Bob and Mel are both Jewish. Mel's real name is Melvin Howard Torma. Uh, he comes from Russian Jews. And Bob Wells' name is Robert Levinson. Uh -huh. And uh, it was on a very hot day in California in 1945. Obviously, a lot going on in the world in 1945. And they had scheduled a writing session with nothing specific in mind. Just so let's get together, you know, see if we come up with something. And my dad drove out to Bob's house, which is in the San Fernando Valley. Are you familiar with, with yeah. LA kind of? A little bit, yeah. I don't get out down there a ton. I'm gonna go down there actually in a couple months, but uh, you know, I, so I'm not super- You're better off, you're better off in Napa. I, Napa's I know general. This is the way to be, place to be, right? So yeah. So the valley is about 15 degrees hotter than the other side of the hill. And dad lived up on top of the hill above Beverly Hills. So they scheduled this writing session. And uh, my dad goes to Bob's house and walks up to the front. And it's about 10 o'clock in the morning. It's already like 98 degrees, but uncomfortable because the valley at that time just, it, that's why it's a valley. It's a basin and all that heat just kind of, kind of collects. So he knocks on the door. There's no answer. Opens the door, walks in because in 1945, people could do that. Uh, walks in and he can hear that the shower's going. And on the piano, he saw, you know, a sheet of paper with four lines written on it. And Bob comes out of the shower and dad takes a look. He said, well, what is this? And he says, well, I was just trying to come up with some cool thoughts because I'm so overheated. So I came up with chestnuts roasting on an open fire, Jack Frost nipping at your nose, Yuletide carols being sung by a choir and folks dressed up like Eskimos. And it just kind of cooled me off. And dad said, you know what, I think we can do something with this. And they ended up writing the song in about 50 minutes. So wow. that's, that's 1945, two weeks earlier. And this is true, you can't make this stuff up. So two weeks earlier in Hollywood, which also gets unpleasantly hot during the summer, two other Jewish songwriters sitting down to do a writing session. And the one said to the other, this sucks it's just too hot let's get let's get in the car let's drive to santa monica and cool off and his partner said no let's 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 at least give this a shot let's see if we come up with something and julie stein and sammy khan two jewish songwriters came up with let it snow so wow. two classic songs written within two weeks the same year the same 10 miles apart from each other and um, all it takes is blistering heat in la exactly you need some inspiration you need sweltering heat to write a good Christmas song, and it helps to be Jewish. <laughs> yeah. Yes, exactly. Doing songs that last a lifetime. Yeah. Well, last night, my daughter, Sunny, we were in concert last night in, in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, this beautiful theater called The Grand. And I've played there at least a half a dozen times now. And we did our Christmas show there for kids from 192 with Mark Wood and Bailey and everybody on stage. And I brought out my 15-year-old daughter to sing the Christmas song with me. And it's the first time she sung alone with me on stage was last night. And of course she is 15 and she is so woke, she will not sing Eskimo. Uh-huh, really? So, so uh. she sang, uh, so I sang the first two lines, just not sure up with Jack Frost, but you know, she goes, Yuletide carols being sung by a choir and folks wrapped up in winter clothes. Everybody knows. I said, fine with me. I said, I don't know if your grandfather would go for it, but <laughs> I don't care what you sing. 
hey, you know, she got to make it her own. But Absolutely. but your daughter, your daughter Ruby has sung it with you uh, before as well. Like, Ed, what was that experience like for you to uh, to sing with? Um, I mean, with Ruby, with your, I mean, what is that like for you to be able to kind of pass that torch on? In just that didn't ex- I mean, I just never expected it. You know, I, I didn't expect it. I didn't expect it married, much less have kids. So yeah, I had these two teenage daughters who are much smarter than I am and, and talented and can sing. So the first time um, we kind of pulled a bit, we were at, uh, we were at a place called the, the Lawrence University Chapel, which where they do a lot of, uh, a lot of concerts. And I said, well, I'm going to do a song now. I said, and, and this is a song that a lot of people know. Uh, I said, it'd be really great if I can get uh, anybody from the audience. And if you don't know all the words, I'll, I'll carry you through it. Don't get nervous. But if somebody would like to sing this with me, here's an opportunity. Uh, yeah, and trust me, you'll know the song. And this little girl puts her hands, 12 years old, puts her hands up. I said, you know this song? She goes, yes. I said, well, come on up here. And people are like, oh, and she comes up on stage. I said, I said, so, well, nice to meet you. I'm Steve. Uh, and who are you? She goes, well, I'm Ruby. I said, oh, uh, uh, are you here with anybody? She goes, I'm not here with my parents. I said, what's your last name? She goes, March Tormago. You too? What are the odds that we have the same last name? I know where I've seen you before. I said, I saw you in the kitchen this morning. So, <laughs> so we brought her up there. And, you know, some of her friends were there, so they kind of knew what was going on, but a lot of people didn't know her. So uh, she did a great job. I mean, 12 years old, and she's up there in front of her friends and family. Yeah. And she nailed it. You know, she did a great job. Beautiful voice. She was supposed to do it with me last night. But she said, uh, you don't pay me enough. Call my agent. <laughs> really? You don't want to sing with your sister? She goes, no, I'm good. I'm good. I said, really? You don't want to sing with Sonny? She goes, I'm fine. I, I did it once. It's good. Yeah. Said, well, I'll go through your people next time and try and up your price. But she, she's been bit, though, right? Because she likes to perform. She was going to do Matilda before COVID. Uh, and that didn't work out well. I mean, she, she was in you know, her school appleton north is kind of an is known they're an award-winning school for theatric for theater i mean they're known throughout this region not just well in your town they're fine they enter these shakespeare contests all throughout the midwest and they've won it 22 years in a row he wow. the guy who runs the program is just kind of this savant genius nutcase who knows this stuff and comes from the theater in new york and loves working with kids and they did newsies i'd never seen newsies uh, have you ever seen it? The, the I've newspaper. never seen it. No, it's really good. It's yeah. really good. It's about the newspaper strike in, in New York, where they had all these kids working for them. You know, probably it's basically slave labor. Sure. Um, but Disney did a movie of it, and the songs are really good. It's not like oh, this is cute. It's a well-written musical. The songs are catchy as hell. Well, Ruby got one of the one of the parts, one of the lead parts as a freshman, and they don't give parts to freshmen. So she got the lead in that, and last year, you're right, she was she was the lead. She was Matilda, and okay. Matilda has lots of choreography and lots of great music, and the sets are really intricate. And they spent all year working on this thing. And the night opening night, she's taking a shower, and we're getting ready to take her. And I know she's, <clears throat> I get choked up even talking about it. I saw okay. the rehearsals, and she's so excited. And we know she's going to come out at the end. She's going to be the last one out and take the last bow and they're gonna go nuts. And the phone rings as she's in the shower. Um, we have to postpone, there's a virus. That was it, open yeah. again. She never got to do the play. So you know, I said, well, why don't they just do it this year? And I said, well, too many seniors graduated, have gone up to college. They can't call and say, hey, can you come back and do your high school musical? Right, I know, that's not the, you can't really, right? You gotta move on and it's tough because it's, what do you do, you know, Mike? My nephew, I guess you can call him my nephew, my ex-wife's nephew. Oh, you have an ex-wife know. too. I knew we had something coming. We have ex-wives. I have an ex-wife, yeah. <laughs> but I don't know. Anyway, this this boy in my family was going to do Adam's family and he had a lead in it. And it was it was set to start like that weekend or something. And you know, and and he is an actor. Like he, he's got he's got the singing, he's got the acting, like he was Ralphie in a Christmas story locally, it knocked it out of the freaking park, and mm-hmm. he was freaking devastated because you put all this work into something like that it is. You, it's devastating and, yeah and it's you know I and mean, it's just ripped from you and there was and, a lot that was ripped from everybody but you know yeah and for her this was a this was the perfect part for her 
Matilda yeah. is this, do you know the story at all? It, uh, I mean, I know the kids books and, this, and the movies. Well, and, Matilda and is so. like this, this feisty little yeah. girl at this, at yeah. this school and she's got um, yeah. telekinetic powers. Uh -huh, yeah. Move things. Move fly things around. Yeah, right, yeah. exactly. And there's a real mean teacher there. And you know, that's yeah. the conflict. But Ruby, because she can sing and she's just, she's got it on stage. She owns it. She's so geared up to do this. And it's like whoosh, the air out of the balloon, and that was it. So, yeah. so they're gonna do a musical this spring. And she wanted they they were gonna choose between Anastasia and another musical, and she really wanted to do Anastasia because she wants you to the lead. I, I said, you know, you're not guaranteed the lead. There are other, other kids in that school. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they're not doing uh, it in our living room. Yeah. But she probably would have gotten the lead in Anastasia. So they're, they're not doing that. They are doing, ladies and gentlemen, drum roll. They are doing SpongeBob the Musical. Oh, okay. So she's going to be SpongeBob I, or no? <laughs> Which I hear is good. I'm going, really? Go, oh yeah, the, the music's good. It's charming. It's really colorful. I said, well, I, I would think so. So she wants to play SpongeBob. Yeah. Okay. So we'll we'll see. see. Yeah, we'll Auditions see. are on January third and fourth, and I know that now she's gearing up for it. She's listened to the book. She's mm -hmm. got one of those photographic. She hears a song once, and it's locked in. I go, "How do you do that?" I said, "I've got a great memory that takes me four or five times to really get all the lyrics down." She goes, "Well, you're not me." <laughs> no, yeah. I'm not. Yeah, yeah, that's well, that's amazing. That's awesome. It's, it's, and, I'm looking forward to seeing her on stage again. Yeah. And I guess I, I should ask you about the other side of that. You know, uh, you got to perform that song with your dad. I mean, what at Carnegie Hall? Yeah. What What was that like? What was I mean? Um, my my thing was just don't be competitive. Just sing the song with them. Yeah. They, they, they're not going to be when the song's over. They're not going to go. Well, how do you think? I'll give it a nine. No, just sing the song because I'm competitive by nature by playing so much sports and I just am. And probably even subconsciously, I would be competitive because it's Mel Torme, it's your father and everybody knows who he is. And he's this amazing singer that everybody talks about. And now here's your chance to, to show your wares. And I just sublimated all that. So don't do that. Just sing with your dad and enjoy it. So it, it was great. I mean, we sang together maybe half a dozen times in public. Um, he would always say, Steve, let's sing Lulu's back in town. I go, it's always going to be the same song, but it works. It, it's got a scat section in it and people know that he sang that tune. Uh, and he always came through for me. I asked him maybe three or four times I'd be doing a gig in Los Angeles, say, hey, will you get up and do a song with me? And he never turned me down. And even when he was sick and he, and he had a bad cold one time Aww. and he said, okay, I'll be there. And I, I took it for granted then. And I look back on it now, I go, you know what? He didn't have to. He could have easily bowed out and said, I really can't sing tonight, but he was there for me. And, you know, we weren't that close. So it was pretty nice of him to do that. I, again, I look back on it now and say, wow, it was pretty special. Yeah. yeah. I mean, what an upper opportunity for sure. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. So tell me about the experience of, I mean, becoming a, uh, a DJ, right? You know, 91 won the Avenue. Like, I mean, tell me, you've been doing that for a while now. You're still doing it, right? Yeah, 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 I'm on and, too much. I'm so, on that station too much. They, they moved you to the weekend also, like at expanded, right? Like, it, yeah, it's it's all Steve all the time. <laughs> <laughs> it kind of is. You know, Just like I, your I, inner monologue, like a running. You know, <laughs> if I'm in the car and I'm listening, the girl said, could you turn that off? No, no but I'm, I'm on in a second. Yeah, we know. We hear you at home. Just turn it off. Uh, we hear you talking off. It, it was from that album Inside <laughs> Out. When I finished mm -hmm. that, I, I called my wife actually had heard the station. We're driving around. She goes, have you heard this station called 91? I said, well, I don't really pay attention to the station. I mean, I yeah. listen to the radio once in a while. I usually play CDs in the car. She goes, that's pretty cool. It's called The Avenue. And they seem to have a real kind of different playlist. I said, oh, no, give it a listen. What the heck? So I listened to it and it was quite different. I mean, it was like, there'd be a Todd Rundgren tune and then Billie Holiday and then Duke Ellington and then Joni Mitchell, and I said, God, this is kind of all over the place. And then Thunderclap Newman, for no reason that, you know, that one hit. So I said, well, I got nothing to lose. I'm gonna call them up and see if they'll play something off Inside Out. So I called, called the station, I got a guy, and said, hi, my name is Steve Marshall, man, Mel Trumme, son, blah, 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 like that was gonna be anything. Uh, right. I said, I got this album I recorded here in Appleton. Can I send it to you to see if you guys are interested? 
And they called me back about three days later. And you know, I said, uh, you know what? There, there are like three cuts here that were interesting. I said, hey, I would have been thrilled if you had said once. I'm very flattered. So they, well, we're going to start putting it in our playlist. I said, great, thank you very much. And about two days later, the general manager called me up and said, can you do a, um, a voice check for us? Can you do a, what's it called? I'm not thinking of it right now. Uh, like a bumper sort of thing. Yes, right? like, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, I said, yeah. I said, you know, hi, this is Steve March Torme. You're listening to 91.1 The App. Great. Uh, the guy, same guy calls me back about a week and a half later. He says, we got a good voice for radio. And we, you know, we have an opening here to host it, do you, could you, could, do you think you could host a radio show? I said, well, I hosted a couple of TV shows in LA. I think I could host some radio here, you know? I said, but if, if there's an opening, I want the best slot. I want yeah. drive time. I want three to seven. I don't want to be on at three o'clock in the morning. And he said, all right, you got it. <laughs> did, they, did they have to bump somebody to give you that or? <laughs> I don't know, maybe they might've moved somebody. Who knows, I never asked. Sure, sure. My enemies. Oh, so the name Torme gets my slot, huh? <laughs> So yeah. that's because his name is Steve. Anyway, there you go. so they gave me that, that spot. And then he came to me uh, a few months later and said, by the way, the person that's doing the morning, we're not that thrilled with them. Uh, what do you think about taking over the morning slot? Said, it's great. You got to pay me more. I'm not going to do it all for free. So now we'll, we'll, we'll bump you up. I said, okay, sounds good. And then finally, the Saturday morning, same thing happened. There was somebody they weren't all that thrilled with. Can you do Saturday morning? I said, well, it's the same deal pay me a little bit more money i mean i don't do this for free I, I do like doing it though but there's a and now it's this 10 years that's 10 years plus of doing this so i have a following um and that helps me when i do concerts here because even last night during the concert i said uh, i was talking about this story and i said uh, do we have any 91 point and you know ah, yes. listen to my show and the gm gave me he said i've got one rule period i've only got one rule don't get us sued yeah so, well, I'll try not to, I'll try not to. And which is, you know, a nice way of saying, don't do politics, don't get into drugs, don't talk about sex, just, you know, we don't mind if you push the envelope a little bit and talk about other things in between songs, but don't, don't get us in trouble, you know, don't be an yeah. idiot. So I've been called into the, I got called into the principal's office three times in 10 years. What, what do you do, Steve? Well, I can do yeah. that here on this show, I can tell. Yeah, tell so, us. The first time, we were playing a song by Carly Simon, which is off an album called, um, oh shoot, it'll come to me. Uh, something Time, I forget what it is. Anyway, it's a pretty well-known album cover. Okay. She's wearing a hat on it. She's got a sweater on. And I said, and that's, uh, that's Carly Simon from uh, da, 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 da. I said, wow, obviously it was a pretty cold day in New York when they shot that one. And I moved right on, that was it. Yeah, look it up. Carly as, time goes, as time goes by what's it called as time goes by is that it or is that no it? no 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 yeah. no go back further uh, uh, you can find this okay i know i'm trying <laughs> i think it's either a blue sweater or or a maroon sweater she's got a hat on and let's just say that she looks it looks like it might have been cold that there was a reason to wear that sweater. no no secrets i believe that might just be it yeah <laughs> Yeah. Well, thank you. So anyway, I said, well, it looks like it was kind of cold. It might've been cold that day. Right. And I left it at that. Yeah. Yeah. That, I went right on it. You know, I didn't say, Hey, did you see her tits on that? No, I'm smarter than that. Well, some lady called up the station and she complained to the general manager said, I was driving my kids to school and Steve March Torme referenced some album and they looked it up on their phones. I don't listen to the, to the Avenue for that kind of stuff. And I got, I said, really? I got called in for that. He said, well, mm -hmm. he said, you know, I said, maybe you, your kids shouldn't be looking at their phone in the back of the car, but what are you going to do? So I got called in for that. That was one. Another one was, um, I mentioned uh, some group like Marcus, like like Mumford and Sons had a concert like at Red Rock or something. Yeah. I said also the the birthplace of uh, Marilyn of actress Marilyn Chambers. I just moved right on. That was it. We get a call from some lady. She goes, you know, I don't know if Steve knows this, but the the pornographic industry can be very very harmful and very hurtful for people. And for him to say that, I didn't say porno actress Marilyn. I said. Actress Marilyn Chambers. So obviously this woman probably worked in the business at some point 
was damaged from it and just it, it evoked some horrible feeling. I had to, I didn't have to, but I called her up and I apologized to her. Really? I felt like yeah. saying, really? I said, yeah. I understand. I understand that. I do know that the industry is horrible to women. I'm sorry that happened. So that was the second time. The first time we were doing a show on April 1st and I finished the show and I said, hey, I'll be back um, yeah, probably on Friday. I said, I have an announcement to make. Um, by the way, I love being here in Wisconsin. I love doing the radio show. But you already know where this is going. Oh, so yeah, I said, yeah. I love doing the radio show. Um, I've made a lot of friends here. I said, but I've got an offer to go back to California and I cannot turn it down. I said, so I'm going to miss my friends. I'm not going to miss shoveling snow, but I am going to miss the friends I've made here. So this will be my last show on the avenue. But thank you for taking my, my family. My... Oh, wait a second. I, I just checked the date. Never mind. I'll see you on Monday. That was it. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the general manager calls me in his office. And says, did, did you tell people you were quitting? I said, I couldn't have made it more obvious. Yeah. I mean, with a hammer. It's a joke. It's, I said, I didn't even do an Orson Welles. I mean, I made it. He said, there were people that are sponsors of ours, and they were working out in a gym, and they were upset about it. I said, well, I'm flattered that they like my show that much. But, geez, sometimes I guess I forget I'm in Wisconsin. <laughs> You know, it needs support groups for yeah. You know, Thank you. Thank big, right? so. <laughs> I'm not that swell on the on the radio that they're going to miss me. I said, but uh, all right, sorry. He said, please don't do that again. I said, I won't. So those are the three times I've been called in, but I'm still I'm on secured landing here. I'm, yeah, yeah. They it's like me. And, I mean, yeah. The ratings are good, and and they like my show because I come up with ridiculous stuff without getting them sued. So I'll take yeah. it. Yeah, it's good. You know. Okay. And, yeah, you got you got to be careful in Wisconsin too because they you know it's it's a little purple there, right? So it is, it is, and you you know, I can't even. My wife is right. She goes, don't even hint at it because you do concerts and yeah. you're going to alienate half your audience. So you why even? Yeah. yeah, I mean, like, I have a friend here. Um, he's part of the the group. Uh, he plays he plays some percussion, plays accordion uh, for this show. And he was a very well-known radio personality here in Appleton. He worked for a station called WAPL. It's a rock, it's a classic rock station. Mm -hmm. And he pushed the envelope a little bit, got away with it to an extent, but did nothing terrible. And on his own Facebook page, which had nothing to do with the radio show, just on his own Facebook page, he wrote about eight months ago, he said, I would never wish for anyone to die, but the world is a better place without Rush Limbaugh in it. And that was it. Yeah. yeah. And he got fired. They put wow. him on, on his own Facebook page. They yeah. put him on suspension and said, there are sponsors here that are not happy with that. Uh, and they kind of, they made him, they kind of hung him out to dry in limbo. And they said, we're going to review this for a week. And I told him, I said, if they want to get rid of you, they would have gotten rid of you. I think, I said, I think you're going to be okay, but you're going to go in, you got to go in there and grovel and tell them I, I didn't, you know, they fired him after the week. They said, you're gone. And he's not been on the radio since. So, so, you know, he plays with us, but he'd still like to be on the radio. So you're absolutely right. It is at best a purple state. And if I say anything, even if I hint at it, you know, what's the point? Let's I, keep want it separate, you know? on stage. Yeah. I, don't, I don't need people going, yeah, why don't you make another smart ass Trump comment? Yeah. No. Nope. Nope. So. Don't need him walking out. You know, it's, it's new. You know? <laughs> telling their friends and, you know, yeah, because my kids go to school. You know, a parent yeah. talks to a parent. Nope, don't need nope. it. Don't need it, don't need it. So do you go on, uh, it's an obvious yeah. question, but do you go on wine tours? Um, not a lot. I've, uh, you know, it's funny, I kind of grew up in Napa. Uh, so, you know, the, the wine piece is, you know, like it's, I, I didn't grow up on wine or anything. So it's just, this is where family is and everything is this, this is home. And here, I'll even, I'll, sp I'll spin it around for you so you can see. Uh, oh but, man, that's gorgeous! Yeah. Right? That yeah. is gorgeous. All right. Well, I'll, I'm gonna I'm gonna share I'm gonna share the favor with you. You ready? Okay. <laughs> oh, also yes. Okay. Yep. See, we both have that appreciation for. See, I couldn't do. I told you I went to the that game and it was I had must have had ten layers on. I don't know, but. <laughs> You know, it was yeah. cold and I don't need negative numbers. I don't need to have these games of let's throw boiling water into the air and see what happens. You know, that's not my idea of a good time, but uh, nope. uh, 
Uh, but, but, you know, my, my kids love the snow. And when it starts to snow, it's snowing. I said, of course you love it. You know why? Because you don't have to move any of it. Yeah. I got to move it. I got to go with a snowblower. And my hands get like, I, that's not fun. It's great when yeah. you're a kid. Oh, it's snowing and Christmas is coming. Yeah. And when you're responsible for getting your car on the driveway, it sucks. So uh, I'll visit the snow. Tahoe is a good place, you know, if you want to visit the snow sort of thing. But uh, thank uh, you. Thank yeah, you. yeah. <laughs> and asking you about going on wine tours is like yeah. asking people from New York. So, what's the Statue of Liberty like? Never been there. Never, never, never been there. I know where it is. Yeah, yeah. It's it it is what it is. But um, yeah. So, just a couple of things left to to ask you about. Um, I'm curious. You got to uh, record with Liza Minnelli, and I think you grew up with her, right? And so you you um, played with her on one of her albums. Uh, she was called Tropical Nights. Right. She was supposed to yeah. do her last, she had a, a obligation to do one more album for Columbia Records. And mm -hmm. I don't know if she'd agree with this or not, but uh, the guy who I, I'm getting ahead of myself. She's never really been a re big record seller. She, you know, she really is a live act. And, and of course, Cabaret made her a star and uh, did some other movies after that too. But the only album that really ever sold was an album called Liza with a Z. Mm -hmm. Because I think that was a, a running thing how do you spell liza is l-i-s-a and so she would tell people it's liza with a z it became an album and it's, it's quite good but outside of that she's not really a big album seller and columbia had an obligation to do one more album and she had barry manilow to produce the album and i think at the last second he got a tour scheduled and the schedule didn't work out he couldn't produce the album and she asked me to i, I was flattered she goes could you produce my album because you know i love your album lucky or you know, the one you did on United Artists, I think we could, I said, well, I, I can't technically do it. I don't have enough technical expertise, but I can be in the booth and help produce this album. Yeah. So we decided to kind of take her out of the box and we hired people that she would never have on an album session. Uh, Steve Morse from the Dixie Dregs. We got Caleb Quay who played with, with Elton on Tumbleweed Connection. So really kind of took it out and Tropical Nights became this rather popular disco cut in the New York, you know, in, in the, the gay nightclubs, that whole gay scene of disco in, in the 80s in New York. And it, it kind of caught on. Um, the album's kind of fun. And I did sing, we sang a Stevie Wonder tune together called uh, I Love Every Little Thing About You. And the only thing I didn't get to do on that, uh, there was a song I wrote called Lucky. And she loved the song and she recorded it. And it would have been the first time I would have actually made some money from something I wrote. And we took a listen to it, the, my co-producer and I, and I, we just looked at each other and said, nah, it's just not right. It's, it's not Didn't working. Hit. This doesn't yeah. sound right. I'd love to get the, the, the credit and actually make a couple of dollars. But so I remember Christmas time is really the first time I think I'm going to make some money where I'm actually going to awesome. go, oh my God, here's a, here's a check for $18. <laughs> You're right. Yeah. Great. So yeah. That, was, that was working with her. She's really sweet. She's we haven't spent that much time together, but she's always been very nice to me. And she's a very interesting human being, obviously. Yeah. Oh, uh, her and Arrested Development is incredible, by the way. Like, it's, it's, it's great, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, she threw a, well, this is just a good story for your show. I was staying with her in New York. I, I, I went into a, to do a nightclub there called 88s, more of a cabaret place. Mm -hmm. And... She said, well, you can stay with me. She had this beautiful penthouse, you know, overlooking Central Park, like it cost $9 billion. Um, she said, you stay with me. I said, oh, thanks. She goes, and I'm so glad that you're coming at this time because you can help me with the party. What? What party? She said, well, the party that we're throwing tomorrow night. What party are we throwing? <laughs> well, for, for, um, for Barbara and Jack. Barbara and Jack? Yeah, so, is it who I think she is? Yeah, well, Barbara Streisand and Jack Nicholson have the same birthday, so we're, I'm throwing a party for them. I said, oh, I see. So I kid you not, she throws this party, and I'm telling you, every big name you've ever heard of in show business is at this party in the penthouse. The first person that walks in is Martin Short. So immediately, we're doing Jerry Lewis. Hi! You know, for half an hour. Yeah. From there on, it was Michael Douglas, then Al Pacino, and then Nicholson, and then Ellen Burstyn, and it, it was everybody. Um, filmmakers, um, 
Who was the guy, the, the lady that was um, beautiful lady that was uh, on the news forever? I can't think of her name because she was much prettier in person than I, than I thought she was. Diane Sawyer. Oh, okay. Yeah. De Niro. Everybody. Oh, my gosh. And, and, the, uh, and in the other room is sitting there, sitting on the bed is Michelle Pfeiffer, Carly Simon, and Eliza. And Michelle Pfeiffer is hiding in the bedroom because she just finished doing a movie with Nicholson called Wolf and he wouldn't, he, he was bird dogging her. He wouldn't leave her alone because he wanted her and she wanted nothing to do with it. So, and they're telling me all these stories. It was an unbelievable night of just yeah. huge stars. People Mine you're never going to see in a living room, yes. but it lies like, in the so, give, give the Oscars a run for its money, right? Like yeah. That's what it was. Yeah. That's, yeah. I thought that I was at the Oscars and I didn't have to drive anywhere and I didn't yeah. have to dress up. So, ah, my wife has walked in. Ah, uh, uh, very nice. Very nice. We better, I better, you better watch okay. your language okay. now. You get away I'll, I'll be careful. I'll be careful. Yeah. I don't want to get you canceled. Don't get me sued. So, yeah. uh, so anyway, she's just a really nice person. And we got to spend, when that party was over, 3.30 in the morning, we're sitting there in her kitchen, just she and I, and she's, well, did you have a good time? It's a great time. So uh, very personable, just a very sweet person. That's all. But obviously grew up in a, very crazy way. Yeah, yeah, different world. Yeah. Um, well, so one other person while we're talking big celebs, uh, uh, Carrie Fisher, your fr friend with Carrie Fisher, right? We went to high school together. We yeah. didn't really, didn't really okay. go to classes together. Okay. okay. Kind of knew each other from high school, uh, ran into her a few times after high school. Uh, Lorraine Newman from Saturday Night Live was mm -hmm. also in my class. Uh, I think that um i'm not again going too fast uh jaws roy scheider and oh oh god i mean i don't know oh, okay. Uh, okay richard dreyfus okay. went to our oh, school well, richard dreyfus okay yeah, yeah i think course. maybe two years that? before i did i mean obviously beverly hills high school you have people that from, yeah. the, from the business so there were there were a few um i didn't know carrie well but i, I it was just kind of sad that she that she passed so young yeah yeah, well, she had a crazy life. I mean, being married to Paul Simon and her mom being where she was, you know, that's that's a pretty interesting story. Yeah, I mean, she definitely left her mark, right? So, without a question, but, you know, you make fun of my cinnamon buns all you want. I'm making billions of dollars. <laughs> I know of everyone, right? You can buy all the cinnamon buns you want for that, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, Steve, I, I want to thank you for taking the time. I appreciate it. And oh, you have so many stories that are incredible. Well, thank you. Well, those are the stories I could tell. So yeah, I, the ones you could tell. They're much uh, uh, another the time. after dark. We'll do the after dark. Uh, <laughs> you let me know. And we won't get you canceled or anything. Like anyway. That. So, well, yeah. thank, you for playing, thank you for playing the song. I appreciate it. Thank you for, for playing the song. So. Yeah, got through it. Didn't I, forget I, the lyrics. All good. You did. You did. Right, well, thank well, you, my friend. And, and stay healthy. Happy holidays. Yeah. You as well, and uh, I hope the rest of the shows go well for you, and uh, you know, much success you. into the into the new year. Okay, appreciate that. All right, have a good one. Right. That was the interview with Steve Marsh Charma here on Concert Pipeline, and typically we do the music news, but as I mentioned earlier in the program, um, we're not going to you know really spend time on music news. There's not a ton going on right now in the music world because most artists are off and um, and I want to end on kind of really positive note um, as well so I want to kind of go through some of the uh, the episodes that we've had um, for Concert Pipeline. Um, this is the uh, 343rd episode of Concert Pipeline uh, that, we're, that we're bringing to you today um, and we started 2021 um, on uh, January 12th uh, with our 290th episode. So if you're decent at math at all, that'll tell you that this is the 54th episode of the program that we've put out uh, over 2021. So while we missed a couple weeks, there were some weeks where we had, there's one week where we had three episodes. Our Bottle Rock week was really packed and we'll get to that. We'll, we'll move sequentially up, but just to say it has been a busy year for the program. Um, I've had the opportunity to talk to a lot of great musicians from around the world. Um, this pandemic has done a, a lot and hurt in a lot of different ways, but uh, one way that I think it's uh, been able to um, improve is in ways of bringing us together. Uh, Zoom 
for uh, for example, um, getting to talk to artists around the world rather than just going out to concerts to interview uh, bands. And I've found that when I interview artists, you know, in their home, in their studio, wherever they happen to be, um, it uh, it's great because we can dig a lot deeper. I don't feel a pressure to rush the interview. Uh, uh, when I'm at the concert with the band, uh, or maybe I only have 15, 20 minutes in those situations sometimes because they got to get to dinner, they have to sound check, they just have to chill before uh, before they go on stage, whatever it may be. Sometimes there's you know some pressures to keep things tight. And in this environment, I'm able to talk to bands for 45 minutes, sometimes an hour, um, you know, if it works out like that. Um, and uh, and really dig deep and uh, and uh, get into uh, their music, how they uh, started out in music, what music they listened to as a kid, you know, all this stuff that's really interesting to me. Um, I get to dig deeper into it through this platform and get to talk to bands who may not be able to make it out to the U.S. or um, aren't uh, able to tour, may not be coming anytime soon, uh, but have uh, great music that they're proud of and want to get out there. Uh, as well. So it's been a great opportunity for, for that. Um, so this year, I did very few in-person uh, interviews. Uh, most all of the interviews that I did were uh, virtually uh, through Zoom in most cases. Um, some that were really exciting to me, I will go through some of the highlights of, uh, of the year for me, um, was the first one was our 300th episode, the Concert Pipeline Tricentennial. Um, and any of these, by the way, most of most all of them, you can go on YouTube, um, on Concert Pipeline's YouTube, and check out the videos for. The tricentennial was a lot of fun. Uh, I look at every hundred episodes to um, to get creative, uh, not you know, try and bring someone on the program who's uh, been influential to me. Do something that we hadn't haven't done before, in a sense. Um, for example, the 200th episode, we had Ben Fong Torres, of Ro the editor of Rolling Stone magazine on. And while he's not a musician, uh, he was represented in my favorite movie, Almost Famous. Um, and, uh, and I had the chance to interview him in his home. So for three, episode 300, it was right around St. Patrick's Day that it was landing. And, um, and so uh, COVID was pretty hot around that time too, uh, in uh, March of 2021. Um, things were a little touchy still. We couldn't get together as easily. So um, Jens, my co-host, and I uh, decided to bring in Joe Wilson, my former co-host for the first 100 episodes of the program. Uh, and we did a live uh, program um, that was a lot of fun, but also, you know, we uh, brought in a band um, we had got to interview Nate Maxwell of Flogging Molly, who's, they're one of my favorite bands. I love them. Uh, I've seen them so many times, interviewed them a bunch of times, and we got to interview him. Uh, we were trying to set it up live, but it didn't work out really th uh, that way. Uh, but we were able to incorporate some of the interview in the Tricentennial and then put the full interview on uh, the next program. So um, we just had fun, hung out, had some drinks, played some uh, some games. Uh, it was so, that sort of thing is so much fun for me because it's chill and uh, but we uh, played a lot of best of clips from the previous 100 episodes as well. Uh, so you can check out the concert pipeline tricentennial that's a fun one. Um, also, a couple episodes later, I got to interview Matt Pinfield, uh, who had a show called 120 minutes that was on MTV. Uh, he was, he's pretty much what I aspire to be in this in this world right I've been doing this uh, interviewing bands for 20 years and uh, and it's something I really enjoy but I'm never getting to the level of Matt Pinfield or, or what have you like and he's one of those that has met everybody interacted with um, with so many rock musicians had a mark on uh, the rock world as well in a number of different senses and uh, and getting to talk to him uh, for a while was was really awesome um okay who else um lyrics born and cutso that was a really fun one representing some local um hip-hop artists that are uh that uh are around and i've gotten the chance to talk to lyrics born before but that was that was pretty cool uh con brio okay so i went out to joshua tree uh with my ex-girlfriend 
Um, we drove down. It was such a long drive. I mean, it was like 10 hours to get down there or something. It was nuts. Um, and it, this was right around the time that concerts were starting to uh, to open up again. Um, June 8th is when that one dropped. So it was right before then. Um, and spent a couple of days down uh, in Palm Springs. But going to a live show uh, out at Joshua Tree, uh, I mean, we paid an absorbent amount for for tickets to that show uh, just to get to see live music again because I miss concerts so freaking much. Um, and it's a band that I liked also, Conbrio. They were great live. Um, and unfortunately, Zeke is not, the lead singer is not with the, the band anymore. He's gone in his uh, separate ways, but they have a new lead singer uh, with, the, with the band that just got announced in the last week or two. Um, so Combrio and Suze Animal uh, that opened for Combrio, uh, that show was was really cool. Um, I think I had a, a gummy or something, you know, to take the edge off and just be chill uh, and enjoy, you know, the evening. So that was uh, that was a lot of fun to get to interview them in person because I'd been doing so many zooms, uh, and and I was rusty in that interview too. I was rusty from in-person in interviews. It was not my best interview ever, but it was great to just interact with bands on that uh, on a direct level like that again. Um, okay, who else uh, did I interview? Um, the record company. I remember really enjoying that. Uh, that uh, that interview, I, I got to talk to them for, uh, I think it was probably a little over an hour. It's just such a fun interview. And I wish I'd taken the time to go to their show when they were here at the Fillmore, because A, the Fillmore fucking rocks. And also um, their show uh, from everything I'd seen was amazing. So I could have gone to it, but I opted against it, I guess. Um, I did a couple of concert reviews. I reviewed Zed, um, which is a, uh, um uh enm is that right uh, electronic D dance edm excuse me edm um uh show and i didn't know much about zed but getting to go there and see that culture that i hadn't really experienced much uh was was pretty cool it was uh, it was a late show so it was later than i like to stay at shows even but i i toughed it out and i stayed for part of his set uh and got to take some pictures and all that um, uh, Brett Denon, I, I covered that show, uh, and, um, didn't interview him or anything, but he came to Napa and I just biked over to the show because it was, uh, early enough in the evening and, uh, and not too far, uh, so it was a free show. So I decided to cover it. Why not? Um, and then let's talk Bottle Rock, um, the Bottle Rock Music Festival. Uh, I, you know, I didn't know how to feel about it, right? Like I had already bought tickets. Uh, early enough and I um, and the Foo Fighters were playing and Guns N' Roses were playing and and it was incredible right it was just an incredible festival and uh, but it was so many people uh, and you know you can't help but feel things are a little covid -y. Uh, I don't know you want to be careful so when I was in crowds I would always have my mask on um, and be super careful in those situations um, but still you don't know right and you hear stories about how things are handled and all, all of that um but i'm so glad i went to that um uh, you know getting to go to that show actually um i mean it did everything for concert pipeline we skyrocketed in terms of our subscribers on youtube solely because of dave grohl uh really uh, because he came out and played with uh, Guns N' Roses on Paradise City in their encore, and the power was cut, and Rolling Stone used uh, my video um, linking, you know, linking to my YouTube page. I got tons, hundreds of subscribers from, from that, which is so cool. Um, I don't do this for that reason, but, uh, but it was cool to get that recognition from Rolling Stone, uh, a, a site that, you know, in a, a magazine that I grew up reading. Just to get that recognition was pretty awesome uh, and to see dave come out like blew my mind right uh, and then he did a surprise set also with greg kirsten uh doing the hanukkah sessions which he revisited again this past hanukkah um and uh, and because he revisited it again that link i think youtube linked a lot of their new videos to my videos uh from bottle rock where he played the whole set of uh eight songs uh from the eight crazy nights in 2020 where they played songs paying tribute to um, Jewish rock 
uh, artist. Uh, so getting to see him do drums in that capacity was was pretty awesome. He did a lot. He did the culinary stage, did some cooking too. That was all right. That wasn't the highlight for me, but it was cool. Uh, and uh, and then the Foo Fighters set, of course, and they played a great rock show. show. So we did three Bottle Rock uh, shows. I got to interview the band Lawrence um, uh, in per another in-person interview, uh, which was fun. We got to go backstage and um, and chat with them. And then I did uh, a, an episode called the Dave Grohl Experience, incorporating everything I just talked about uh, and um, festival performances, where I included just video of a bunch of the performances that I'd had a chance to uh, to see over the course of a couple of days that I uh, went to Bottle Rock. So, uh, so that was that was a lot of fun and put out three programs in one week for the uh, for that one. Um, what else? Bird Talker played some uh, a song I think for the the program. Um, which was pretty cool. I dug their uh, their music. The Zombies, getting to interview uh, a band that was inducted in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame um, and bef before their um, only show of the year um, at Abbey Road Studios. Like, come on, that was that was pretty cool. Um, I definitely dig it. Caught up with Joe Lewis Walker again. Uh, caught up with Carmen de Peace again. Uh, and and Carmine, I mean, that was a cool situation uh, because the uh, Peace Brothers had me on their YouTube show, uh, but they thought that they were asking Steve Jones of the Sex Pistols to be on, and then it ended up being me. And I found out like the day before uh, that you know when I was doing research and saw the end of their last show that they were talking about Steve Jones from the Sex Pistols being on. They still let me come on, which is you know give them a lot of credit for because you know they've come on my program and it was you know it's one thing there but that would you know to, uh, to mix it up like they uh, did and just to you know we had a fun time I think we all had a fun time and then I got to chat with Carmine again uh, afterwards um, an another time so that was that was pretty cool um, Jim McCarty from the Yardbirds another band that's been around forever uh, and got to talk to him again um, I really enjoyed Mark Broussard I just went to his live show uh, uh, at uh, where you play the chapel in San Francisco, and he put on a really great show. Got to talk to him for a couple minutes before the uh, the show and uh, and catch up. Really great dude. And then Naked Ray Gun, um, our most recent episode was uh, also you know a band that most people don't know, but that I uh, being a big Dave Grohl fan, um, I was aware of, and I was looking forward to talking to them. So um, because. He, they were his first concert and um, part of the inspiration of why he went into making music. Uh, so, so that's pretty cool. That takes us up to this point where we are right now. Steve Marcharme, right? Uh, thank you, Steve, for being on the program. And thank you to those that have tuned in. Um, you know, YouTube sent out a year-end kind of recap and, uh, and shared that, um, Concert Pipeline accumulated 1.8 million minutes of views over the year, which just boggles my freaking mind. Uh, I mean, it's just mind boggling. Again, uh, a lot of that was from the Guns N' Roses videos, which did get taken down by YouTube. You can still see those performances in the performance episode, I believe. Uh, I don't think that got taken down, but the video of just their performance did. Um, so, um, so you'll have to seek that out, but... Um, but yeah, I mean, to, to know that that much attention is done to content that I created is just super, super cool. So thank you for tuning in. Um, we're gonna keep going next year. We're gonna do it some more. Um, I do have one episode already lined up that I think I'm gonna start the year off with uh, an artist named Josh Raiden, who's um, really popular and gonna be coming to the Bay, I think in February. So, um, so we'll be rolling that one out early on, but um, this is our show. Uh, thank you for all who tuned in. Thank you to Jens for rolling with me uh, as much as he could in, uh, in this show. Thank you to all of the publicists and managers who have uh, helped make this show possible because without them, um, I wouldn't have any bands probably, right? So, uh, so thank you to them all. I look forward to seeing what we have in store for 2022. Uh, it's weird to even say that, you know, 2022. And I hope that things are much better out in the world. Everybody, you know, be safe, take, you know, look out for those around you and take care. Um, for all of us here at Concert Pipeline, I'm Steve Jones. Okay.